Hallelujah. Don't have my bass voice. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Praise God. So the Lord gave me a word at the beginning of the year for the body of Christ, and I want to discuss that with you tonight. And it's a preparatory word for the future and the things that are going to be coming down the pipe in the future. And so, in fact, I, I got the privilege of preaching this over at Pastor Cindy's church. Liz and I are actually members over there at Pastor Cindy's church. And that's, the Lord told us to do that and hook up, and so we're honored. And she, just so you know, she was really uh, bashful, but the church is doing awesome. She is doing awesome. I mean, she's preaching the word, flowing with the Holy Ghost. She's a, a tremendous blessing, and so she's a tremendous blessing in our lives. And then we go back 40 years, kind of like we do with your Pastor Larry. And um, so thank you, for P Pastor Cindy, for coming tonight, and we're always honored to be with Pastor Larry and Pastor Charlotte because they've been friends forever and we're a lot younger than we look so <laughs> but anyway <clears throat> I want to I want to discuss something um, that God tells us that we're actually supposed to do now and if we get a hold of this I believe if you get a hold of this tonight it'll change the way you get out of bed every morning in fact it'll change the way you approach everyday life it's something that God says that we're supposed to do now and now is where we're supposed to be living a lot of people live in their yesterdays, and it just messes them up. And a lot of people live in their tomorrows. What are we going to do? How are we going to handle this? What's going to happen? And that messes them up. But what does God have to say about today, and how do you approach life today? So let's start here in Ephesians, <clears throat> the sixth chapter, in verse number 10, where Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Interesting here. I thought, Paul says, be strong in the Lord, the power of his might, and he's writing from prison. He's encouraging believers, and it sounds like he's the one that needs to be encouraged, and yet he's encouraging believers. But I believe it's because he's writing not to the just to the church at Ephesus, but to all believers. And I believe he knows that many people are in prisons themselves, maybe not a literal prison, but they're in prisons maybe to their physical illnesses. They may be in prisons to their mental and emotional state. They may be in prisons financially. I think Paul's trying to let us know, as well as the church of Ephesus, how to get out of our prisons. So the first word he uses <clears throat> is the word finally. That means, this word actually, when I looked it up, it means he's getting ready. He's tying in with everything he said with what he's getting ready to say. Finally. So he gives this, he gives us this word. And um, in order really to get the most out of this word you really have to have at least some idea of what he said because what he's tying in goes with what he just said so what i did is i wrote down of course there's five chapters before what he said here in chapter six but i just wrote down a quick synopsis of what he said before he said finally so that once we get into what he said after finally you can understand okay that's why he said this so let me just go real quick through chapter one two three four and five in chapter one paul talks about our redemption he also talks about our inheritance and then he talks about how the holy spirit has sealed us and given us an eternity with jesus somebody shout hallelujah <clears throat> then he ends up talking about how he prayed for the Ephesians. In fact, for those of you taking notes, if you'll make a note of verses 15 through 23, it's a model prayer for Christians. This is a prayer you ought to be praying for your spouse, friends, family, pastors. This is one that you always ought to be praying on a regular basis, Ephesians chapter 1, 15 through 23. And then in chapter 2, Paul talks about our salvation is by grace through faith. Then he talks about how Jesus has now become your peace, your prince of peace, hallelujah. Then he talks about how he abolished the hostility of the law and what it produced and how he has now made us one body with him. <clears throat> and then he talks about how we have access to the Father because we're citizens and members of the household of God. Then in chapter 3, he talks about how God used the apostles and prophets to speak by revelation and make known the mysteries and manifold wisdom of God. And then he talks about how we now have access to Jesus and that we're supposed to come to Jesus with boldness and confidence, no matter what you've done. And then at the end of the chapter, he gives us another. In fact, for those of you, again, taking notes, write 
chapter 3. We're in chapter 3, right? Yeah, chapter 3, verses 14 through 19, because it's another model prayer. It's a prayer you ought to be praying over yourself and praying over others. So that's verses 14 through 19. And then in chapter 4, Paul talks about how we are to walk in humility, modesty, gentleness, patience, endurance, steadfastness, and perseverance. Then he talks about how we are all one body with one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God who is the Father of us all. Then he talks about how after Jesus ascended, that he released God's grace and gave us five ministry gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And he tells us those gifts are given to equip believers so they can work in the ministry and help the body of Christ grow up. Then he talks about how we as believers are supposed to be adults in Jesus, quit, quit acting like children, quit being tossed to and fro with all these false doctrines. And then he says, act like grown-ups. It'll cause each one of you to do your part if you do and keep the body of Christ together and joined by the love of God. And then he talks how, about how we're interesting. He, he tells Christians, stop acting like sinners <laughs> and start acting like the new man that he's made you righteous and holy. And then he talks about how not to give place to the devil. Then he talks about how to only allow good things to come out of your mouth. And then he ends that chapter 4 by talking again. You wouldn't think you'd have to tell Christians this, but be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another the way Jesus forgave you. Amen. And then in chapter 5, he tells us to start our life living by imitating the life of God. Stop imitating the unsaved and don't partake of their lifestyles. Then he says, now because you're a child of light, you should have no business engaging in the unfruitful works of darkness. And then he talks about how to use our time wisely instead of getting drunk on wine. He tells us how to stay filled with the Spirit by speaking and singing the Word of God and giving thanks to God continually. And then he talks about how husbands and wives are to love and respect each other and submit to one another in God's love. And then he gets to chapter 6 and talks to those of us that would have parents, which I would think if you're alive, you have a parent. Um, he says, listen, if you have parents, he give heed to godly instructions, honor them. Doing so will cause things to go well with you, and you'll extend your life in health and prosperity. I thought that's interesting because it never says honor your parents if they were honorable. It never says honor your parents if they deserve it, if they raised you right. It says honor your parents so that it'll go well with you. It sounds like more to do with you than them, right? So he says if you want things to go well with you and you want to live in health and prosperity, you better honor your parents. Then he talked to those of us who have bosses. Maybe you work for someone or you have someone above you, a supervisor or something. He says work for them as though it is Jesus you're working for. And he says, if you do that, then Jesus will be the one to reward you openly. And then it brings us to this 10th verse here in, in chapter 6 where he says the word finally. The word finally is actually a Greek word. Uh, it's an adverb in the Greek. And for those of you that may not have uh, done great in English, an adverb is a modifier. It, it modifies a sentence, a verb, a preposition, an adjective. For example, you could use the little small sentence, he ran. Well, ran is a verb, but if you used an adverb, you could tell how he ran. You could say, he ran quickly, and you add the adverb. Or an adverb will modify and tell you, like, when he ran. You could say, he ran yesterday. Uh, I could tell you where he ran. He ran over to Pastor Larry's house. <clears throat> it can tell you how often he ran like he ran every day this week. So Paul starts with an adverb here when he uses the word finally. Actually, it's an adverbial phrase. He says, finally be strong. Finally be strong in the Lord. So he's actually using a modifier to tie in everything he said with what he's getting ready to say. In other words, let me give you an example. You're going to have to be strong in the Lord uh, to walk in your redemption. You're going to have to be strong in the Lord to uh, receive your inheritance. You're going to have to be strong in the Lord to pray for others. You're going to have to be strong in the Lord to allow Jesus to be your peace at all times. You're going to have to be strong in the Lord to still come to Jesus with boldness and confidence when you screw up. 
You're going to have to be strong in the Lord <clears throat> to not follow after religious fads. You're going to have to be strong in the Lord to act like the righteous and holy person that God says you are. You're going to have to be strong in the Lord to not give place to the devil. You're going to have to be strong in the Lord to only allow good things to come out of your mouth. You're going to have to be strong in the Lord <clears throat> to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another the way Jesus has forgiven you. Are you understanding what I'm meaning by a modifier? So the first thing Paul says is be strong in Jesus and the power of his might. Be strong in Jesus. He wouldn't have to tell us to be strong if we were always just strong. <laughs> he would just say, keep acting like you always been. <laughs> but for him to say be strong, that means that we're going to have feelings of weakness, feelings of lack of ability, inadequacy, frustration, hopelessness. But God tells us what to do. Be strong. Actually, it's just one word. If you look this up in the Greek, it's just one word. But let me give you the four definitions of this, this Greek word. It means empowered. It means enabled, it means increase in strength, and it means be strong. I'm going to repeat those four definitions. Empowered, enabled, increase in strength, and be strong. But it doesn't stop there. The key really is in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. That's why I, say, I said this is really an adverbial phrase. Because you are empowered, you are enabled, you are strengthened, and you can be strong because of where you are in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things passed away, behold, all things have become new. You know, Daniel made this statement in chapter, Daniel chapter 11, verse 32. He said, the people that do know their God will be strong. And then it goes on in the King James, it says, and do exploits, but the word exploits is italicized. It actually wasn't in the Greek or in the Hebrew. And so I was looking at that. I thought, wait a minute, the people that do know their God will be strong and do. That's where it ends. And so I looked up that word do, and it actually means to advance or to accomplish. So when you know your God, you're going to advance the kingdom of God. You're going to accomplish things for God. Amen. And so uh, Isaiah 35, 4, you don't need to turn there right now, but it says those of us of a fearful heart be strong and do not fear. And then the same thing over, pretty much over in uh, 2 Chronicles 32, 7. Be strong and courageous when facing your enemies because there's more with us than there are with them. Amen. Same with Joshua 1, 9. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or discouraged for the Lord is with you everywhere you go. You are in Christ so you can be strong because of where you are. So I thought about, I thought about okay, so really in order for us to be strong, we have to know who we are in him. Really have to know who you are in the Lord because it says be strong in the Lord. It doesn't say be strong in yourself. So it says be strong in the Lord. And so I wrote down some verses. I'm not going to have you turn there for time's sake. But if you're taking notes, I'll give you the reference. And I'm going to just quote what each verse says about who you are in the Lord. Romans 3.24 says because you're in Christ, you are redeemed and made right with God because of his free, unearned, undeserved grace. Hallelujah. Romans 8, 1 says, because you're in Christ, you can now live a life free from condemnation. Amen. Romans 8, 38, 39 says, there's nothing you can do or anyone else can do that can stop God from loving you. Isn't that good news? 1 Corinthians 1, 30 says, because you're in Christ, you have all of God's wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. It's all in you. Praise God, you have those things right now. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, because you're in Christ, he, he always causes you to triumph. Everybody say always. always. Isn't that a good word? <laughs> always causes you to triumph. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says, because you're in Christ, God, this is good, God is not keeping any record of your sins, your mistakes, your failures. He's not keeping any record of them. Hallelujah. Galatians 3.26 says, your faith in Christ has made you part of God's immediate family. You're not an aunt, uncle, or cousin. <laughs> You're a son or daughter of the Most High God. The creator of all things is your daddy. Amen. Ephesians 1, 3 says, because you're in Christ, God has already given you every blessing that is available in heaven. You don't have to wait till you get to heaven. He's already given you every blessing of heaven. That's why God said, thy will be done on as it is in heaven. Wow. Ephesians 2, 6 says, because you're in Christ, God has given you a seat in heaven right next to Jesus. 
I, I preached that one time. I was so glad my wife was with me. I preached that, and I said, look at that. You're omnipresent just like God. And then she said, honey, not omni, duo. <laughs> You're not omnipresent. That'd be everywhere. But at least we're in more place than once. One, you may be sitting here right now, but God says you're seated with Christ in heavenly places. So I was glad she corrected me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, because you're in Christ, God has hand, I love this one, God's handcrafted you, assigned things for you to do in this life, and given you the ability to do them. Hallelujah. That means you're enabled by God's grace to do everything he's called you to do. Philippians 2, 5 says, because you're in Christ, you have the mind of Christ, and you can operate in Jesus' mental state. Hallelujah. Now, turn with me over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to go to verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. It says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So this is saying because you're in Christ, you can partake of his grace to be strong. Be strong is what we're looking at in Ephesians 6.10. And notice it says be strong in the grace. So now this is letting you know this isn't being strong in yourself just like it wasn't being uh, a savior to yourself when you got born again. You had to put your faith in grace. By grace, you're saved through faith, right? So it had nothing to do with you performing good or you doing right things. It had to do with you accepting that Jesus did everything to make you right. So now he's saying, if you're going to be strong, you're going to have to be strong the same way. Kind of reminds me of Colossians 2.6 that says, the way you receive Christ is the way you walk in Christ. The way you received him is the, wa- the way you continue to live the rest of your days on earth. Well, how did you receive him? By grace through faith. So how do you walk in him? By grace through faith in your healing, in your marriage, in your finances, in your emotions, by grace, through faith. Can I hear an amen? So be strong. That's what we're looking at. We'll get back there over to Ephesians. But turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. I really sound funny tonight. I will not listen to this tape, <laughs> this recording. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, which says, watch, I'm going to actually read from the New King James. So 1 Corinthians 16, 13, it says to do four things. It says, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, and be strong. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. This is something God's telling us to do right now. So if you're wondering, what am I supposed to do this week? What am I supposed to do for the rest of the year? What am I supposed to do next year? Here are some things God's actually commissioned you to do. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave and be strong. So I'm going to talk about each one of those for a minute. Let's talk about the first one, watch. The word watch means in the Greek, it means to stay awake, to be watchful, to be vigilant, to give strict attention to. And then I caught this last definition of the Greek, to be cautious. Be cautious. So for those definitions, stay awake, be watchful, be vigilant, give it strict attention, be cautious. I thought, then that means Satan's going to try and do things to stop us and hinder us from doing what God's called us to do. And so we've got to stay awake. We've got to be watchful, be vigilant, give strict attention to and be cautious. All of those definitions are letting us know really the same thing as Peter said over in 2 Peter 5, 8, where he said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That says, be sober and be vigilant. So it's really saying the same thing. Stay on your guard. Don't fall for the snares or the traps or the trickery of Satan. So here in 1 Corinthians, it tells us to watch. The second thing it says is to stand fast in the faith. The Greek says to stay stationary, be persistent, and persevere. So get a hold of those definitions. Stand fast in the faith means to stay stationary, to be persistent, and to persevere. So therefore, it means you got to stay stationary in your faith. you got to be persistent in what Jesus has made you and what he's given you. And then you have to persevere when things don't go your way. 
In other words, you don't be moved by what you see, hear, and feel. You realize what you see, hear, and feel can be moved by the truth of the Word of God. Galatians 5, 1, we're talking about stand fast here. Galatians 5, 1 says, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. And then if you go on reading there, it talks about how not to be entangled trying to keep a bunch of laws from the Old Testament to gain God's approval. Jesus already gained God's approval for you. God's approval is not based on your performance. It's not based on what you do or what you don't do. It's totally based on what Jesus has already done. Amen. So it tells us to watch. When you stay alert. Be cautious. Pay attention. Then he tells you to be persistent and use your faith to persevere. Don't be moved by the information obtained by your physical senses. Watch, stand fast in the faith. Then the third thing that it says is to be brave. I love the King James that says something we don't even understand. Quit ye like men. <laughs> what the world you saying, quit ye like men? Well, it means to man up. It means to be a man. It means don't be a wimp. <laughs> You know, don't, don't be a coward. Quit acting like a defeated pup, you know. Or I, I like to say this, don't act like the lion on the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> well, that'll date you because young people don't even watch the Wizard of Oz, probably. But, but if you watch the wizard, he was not courageous, was he, until the wizard gave him courage. But let me tell you, you have someone much more powerful than that wizard. He's the creator of all things, and he's given you courage. In fact, he's given you himself. <laughs> First Samuel 4, 9 says that be strong and quit yourselves like men. Quit yourselves like men and fight, he says in Samuel. In other words, be courageous. So I, then I started seeing when I was looking at all these different scriptures that say be strong, then I started seeing the scriptures that contain both be strong and be courageous. In fact, let's look at a couple of them. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 32. 2 Chronicles chapter 32. You notice every one of these verses, we've looked at quite a few already that talk about be strong doesn't make a suggestion. It doesn't say try and be strong. Be strong if everything's going your way. <laughs> Every one of these we're looking at is saying be strong, period. It kind of sounds like you need to act in faith. When all hell's breaking loose, you need to let all heaven break loose, right? Praise God. So be strong. Look here at 2 Chronicles 32, 7. It says be strong and courageous. Hmm, there's both of them. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. So there's do not fear. Uh, don't be dismayed, which is don't be depressed or discouraged, before the king of Assyria, nor before all the multitude that's with him. For there are more with us than there are with them. Now, sometimes when people read these Old Testament stories, they just think, oh, well, that was just talking about the children of Israel and the king of Assyria. But remember what 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 says. It says, every story written in the Old Testament was written for examples for us to learn from. So really what it's saying here in 2 Chronicles 32, 7, he's saying be strong and courageous when you face your enemies. Not just them, but you when you face your enemies. Why? There's more with us than there are with them. That reminds me of 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 16, I believe it is, that uh, Elisha uh, and his servant, they wake up after the whole city of Dothan is surrounded. You know, the king, the, the king had gotten wind, king of Syria, and, and so he sent his whole army to surround Dothan because he found out that's where Elisha was. So Elisha and, and his servant wake up that morning, and the servant first wanted to go out and look out over the city, and he sees it surrounded. And um, the King James, I'm sure, is a little bit wimpy for us, you know, because uh, the King James says that the master said, alas. I mean, the servant said, alas, master. <laughs> I'm sure it was more like, ah! <laughs> Elisha, what are we going to do? We're going to die. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, in that chapter, that's where Elisha prays and said, God, would you open my servant's eyes? Now, his eyes, his natural eyes were open, remember, because he already saw the whole city surrounded by those natural horses and chariots. And so Elisha prays and said, God, open his eyes. And God opens his eyes. Then he was able to see into God, the God realm. 
I'm so jealous of Bruce. He stepped over into the God realm. <laughs> we all get to pretty soon, though. And it's not like a long trip. Let me just tell you, it's just here, and then you're here. <laughs> yeah, death is just swallowed up in victory, and you're, you're there, baby. <laughs> but he, he let Elisha's servant see into the God realm where we're all going to be spending eternity. And all of a sudden, the servant sees all these horses and chariots of fire way outnumbering the horses and chariots that were there in the natural. That's what God has for you. Remember, this is written for your admonition, your example. There's more with you than any devil or any demon. Amen. I don't know where we got this this crazy idea. It's just got to be religious, I guess, the traditions of men. That, well, when you're born, God assigns this little fat baby angel that plays a harp. (laughs) And once you grow up, he says, bye-bye. You're on your own. No, when you get older, you need him more than when you were a baby. (laughs) No, I believe he signs a legion to every one of us. Legion of angels. There's more with us than there are with them. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Turn over to Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. Joshua 1, 9. Anybody getting anything? Even with the weird voice? (laughs) It's it's sounding better. Oh, good. (laughs) Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. He says, have I not commanded you be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you everywhere you go. I remember one time, I don't know if you, because he said it a number of times, different crusades, but our dad in the faith, the late Kenneth E. Hagin, he was preaching one time, and he read a verse like this. I don't remember if it was this exact verse, but he said, the Lord's with you everywhere you go. He said, you know what? If we believers would just believe one verse, our bad days would be over. He said, just a verse like this, that you actually believe God is with me. If you actually believe that, you wouldn't be griping and complaining and saying, oh, what am I going to do? Oh, that's right. God's with me. <laughs> Come on. He said, and it's kind of an anomaly, if believers would just believe. I thought that's what we were. <laughs> if believers would just believe. One verse. And I thought, man, that's why I've gone through a lot of these verses, and I just don't have down days, stress-filled days, down, depressed days. I just refuse to have them because God's with me. I remember, I remember reading after, I think it was John G. Lake, because I've, I've read so many different ones, John G. Lake and Smith Wigglesworth and different ones, and, but I think it was John G. Lake that would get up every morning and look in the mirror and say, God lives in that man. It's not just a revelation that God is with me. He was under the old covenant like this we're reading. He was with him, but with us, he's not just with us. He is, but he's also in us. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Hallelujah. So have I not, now now this proves what I'm talking about. Have I not commanded you, be strong, not a suggestion. Be strong, be courageous, and do not fear. Don't be discouraged and depressed, for the Lord your God is with you everywhere you go. I think that word for, F-O-R, is the one you need to highlight or circle in your, verse, in your Bible. That's what I did in my Bible. It's for. I've not, have I not commanded you be strong, courageous, don't be afraid or to. For. Here's the reason. Because. For. Because. God is with you. Wow. And somebody says, yeah, Brother Larry, but I don't feel like he is. Well, that's why we talked about why we just read that you have to be persistent in your faith and not walk by sight, but walk by faith. All right, turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy 31, 6. This is good stuff, isn't it? Deuteronomy 31, 6. And this is something that we don't want to just hear and forget. This is something God wants us to take, and then when the times come in the months and years ahead, when all heaven's breaking loose, we're going to have the greatest revival we've ever seen to mankind that eclipsed the book of Acts, but all hell's going to be breaking loose at the same time. You're going to have a 1,000 fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, so there's going to be times of grieving where our emotions, we cry, we weep with those who weep. 
Unfortunately, those things are going to happen, but there's going to be billions of people that get ushered into the kingdom of God. Not a billion. The Lord told me billions, so I know at least two. God said billions are going to be ushered into the kingdom. Amen. And so, uh, so get ready. But God says you're going to have to be strong in the Lord, not in yourself. You're going to have to be strong in the Lord. So look at Deuteronomy 31.6. Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid of them. Who's them? Your enemies. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you, and he won't fail you or let you down. Wow. All right, go back to Ephesians 6 with me. That's where we start, Ephesians chapter 6, where he says, Finally, my brethren, <clears throat> be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So Paul says, be strong. The only way you can be strong is in the Lord or in Christ. And when you're in Christ, then you have, according to this verse, you have the power of his, of his might on the inside of you. I remember reading in Micah where Micah the prophet in, in Micah chapter 3 verse 8 where he said, uh, he said, I am full of the power of the Lord and his might. I thought, now here's a prophet under the old covenant that he said, I'm full of the power of God and full of his might. And I thought he didn't even have the greater one living on the inside of him. How much more should you and I be saying, I'm full of the power of God and the might of God because I've got the greater one on the inside of me. Yes. Hallelujah. Um, in fact, that reminds me, remember over in um, Judges chapter 6, if you read Judges chapter 6, 7, and 8, it tells the whole story of Gideon. But in verse 11, Judges 6, 11, Gideon was down in a pit threshing wheat. Actually, he was hiding from the Midianites. And God says this to Gideon, Gideon, you mighty man of valor. And he was a wimp. <laughs> he was hiding from his enemies, acting like a wimp. But, but see, God said, no, no, you're, you're a mighty man of valor. I'm telling you the real you. In fact, I'm going to encourage every one of you I'm going to do a little advertisement, and it's not for my benefit because I don't get a penny out of it. But I just put a, I'm, I'm just uploading a whole series on our YouTube channel, our Larry Hutt Ministry YouTube channel. It's called The ABCs of True Christianity. The ABCs of True Christianity. And the Lord had me start teaching it. And I thought, okay, this, I, I, knew, I knew where he was taking me. I knew what I was going to be teaching along the lines of through the series. And I thought, now I do a daily TV program five days a week. I said, this is probably, probably going to be a three- or four-month series every week for three or four months. It ended up going 51 weeks, one week short of a whole year. And the Lord told me, this is my alphabet. He spoke that. He said, the ABCs is my alphabet. If you know these ABCs, you'll know all the way to the XYZs. The ABCs is who you really are, who God really made you, and then what he's already given you, and then what he's already enabled every believer to do. I've seen people that were baby Christians. Listen to this somebody that was just a year old in Jesus, and they get a hold of these truths, the ABCs. And in a year's time, they're more mature than a lot of 30-year Christians, even some that went to Bible school. So I'm going to encourage you. Again, it's free, so it doesn't, I'm not getting any benefit. If you go to our Larry Hutt Ministry YouTube channel, start watching the ABCs of true Christianity. You want to grow in the Lord and the power of his might? I'm telling you. It'll, it'll really change your life. All right. So anyway, we're talking about God calls Gideon this mighty man of valor. Well, that kind of goes along with Romans 4, 17. God calls those things that be not as though they already are. Right? I could give you my definition of that. God calls those things that already are or, or that don't appear to be real, but they really are real because God said so. <laughs> yeah. God calls those things that don't appear to be real, but in truth, they are real because God said so. That's calling things that be not as though they are. Turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 10 with me. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 17. Deuteronomy 10, 17. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Deuteronomy 10, 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods, the Lord of lords, a great God and a mighty God. I really wanted to just get to this word mighty because he's a mighty God, and we know that, and there's many verses I could take you show them that he's a mighty God. But I want you to understand he lives in you. So if you're supposed to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, and he's a mighty God and he's in you, then you have that might in you. All the might that you need to overcome everything in life. So we're talking about being strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. In fact, turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. This will be good to put in here. Verse 3, 4, and 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. And it says this. It says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. I looked up the Greek word carnal. It means of human origin. So in other words, our weapons are not from humanity. They're from the supernatural realm. They're from our Father God. So the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty. Everybody say mighty. Remember, you can be strong in the Lord, the power of his might. So our weapons are mighty for, for God, uh, in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. That's a whole other sermon right there. <clears throat> but what I want you to see is your armor is mighty. Because it's God's armor. It's not your armor. It's God's armor. Your weapons are mighty because they're God's weapons. Romans 13, 12 says, put on the armor of light. You know light's more powerful than darkness. Ephesians 6, 16 says, you have the armor of faith. It'll stop every fiery dart of the wicked one. 2 Corinthians 6, 7 says, you have the armor of righteousness. That keeps you free from sin because righteousness will cause you not to yield to sin. Ephesians 6, 17 says, you have the sword of the Spirit and the Word of God. And Hebrews 4, 12 says, the word of God is alive and, excuse me, and powerful. I was thinking, isn't it interesting that with all this might and all this power that's available to Christians, yet so many believers are living defeated, woe is me type lifestyles? Why, why is that? Well, because even though you have God on the inside of you, even though his power is in you, even though his might's in you, even though his strength is in you, you still have to be, we found out this morning, you still have to be a doer of the word. Oh, you mean it's come to that? <laughs> yeah, you have to be a doer of the word. Somebody says, well, well, Brother Larry, what word? Well, a lot of them, but at least this one, be strong. <laughs> he says, be strong so you have to do that you have to act like that's true no matter what it looks like no matter what you feel no matter how you're being treated by other people no matter what's going on in society a uh, society or politics be strong be strong means you're going to say if you're yielding to what god says remember what i said when god says something for you to believe that what he says is truth then that empowerment that grace that enablement then gets on you and in you so that you can be what he said be. You can't do this in your own strength. So he says, be strong, okay? I'm strong. Kind of kind of reminds me of Joel chapter, you know, the prophet Joel chapter 3, verse 10. Let the weak say, oh, some of you know that verse. The others that didn't know that verse, that's what the prophet Joel said back in Joel chapter 3, verse 10. Let the weak say. See, they even had... Revelation under the Old Testament that you got to speak the word. You got to speak what God says. Amen. Acts 17, 28, I believe it is that in him we live and move and have our being. That's where you really live. In him is where you're going to be strong. Strong in the Lord. So in him we live. In him we move. In him we even have our very existence. Hallelujah. Let me close tonight with Ephesians, or no, not Ephesians, Hebrews chapter 13. Go over to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hebrews 13. And I'm going to start because I mentioned this morning, those of you that were here, you know, 
the Bible was never written in chapter and verse, and so verses were just added later on. Sometimes they were divided good. Other times the verses should have gone together because it's easier to understand. But I'm going to start at the middle of verse 5 where it says, for he has said, in the middle of verse 5, because I want you to see something. In the middle of verse 5, for he, talking about God, God has said, I want you to see what God said. Hebrews 13, we could say 5b, <laughs> the middle of verse 5. <clears throat> God has said, I will never leave you or forsake you, so that we may boldly say, the Lord's my helper, I'll not fear what man shall do to me. Wow. God has said, I will never, ever, never, ever, never, ever, never, ever leave you. So you're never alone. When the devil jumps on your shoulder and says you're so alone, nobody cares, nobody loves you, nobody's supporting you, quit, stop, just say, hey, shut up, devil, because God's right here with me. I'm not alone. I have the greater one, and, and he's on my side. I'll never leave you. And he said, I won't forsake you. That means he's not going to let you down. You say, but I just feel like so many times I've been waiting on God. Yeah, but it's through faith and endurance that you inherit. the. That's been the problem with our definition of patience in the Bible. The word patience doesn't mean you sit by and wait 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 and wait. And that's not what it means at all. If you look up the Greek word definition that's used patience in the Bible through faith and patience, you inherit the promises. Let patience have her perfect work. If you look that up, it's a steadfastness, it's a perseverance, and it's an endurance. In other words, I'm not quitting, I'm not giving, I don't care what it looks like, I don't care what it feels like, I'm staying with the Word of God. That's the kind of faith that gets results. So here he says, I'll never leave you, I won't forsake you, so that we may boldly say, wait a minute, um, I want you to circle three words in this verse. Circle three words right here. So, or actually, so two words. Let's circle two words. So that. Circle those two words. So that. So God has said, and then we see what God said. So that. So now it's getting ready to tell you why God said it. He didn't just say it so that all of a sudden Hebrews 13, 5, and 6 would not be blank. <laughs> right? So if he said it, there's a purpose of him saying it. And he didn't say it just for his benefit. In fact, he didn't say it for his benefit at all. Here's the benefit. So that we may boldly, confidently, with assurance say, what are we going to say? Well, since God's with me, he's my helper, and I will not fear what? Government. Man. Come on. What man, I'll not fear what man, that means I'll not fear what the WEF that's run by a bunch of billionaires, what they may try and do, I may not. I'm not going to fear man, a corrupt government. I'm not going to fear man, anything, anywhere, anything that's being that I will not fear because God said he's with me. But notice the key here is, which, is what we were looking at this morning. We spent the whole morning is creating your future with the words coming out of your mouth. How to create your future. And that's what we talked about this morning. And now we're seeing right here, God has said so that we may put whatever he said in our mouth and boldly declare it. So that tells me then anything God has said I'm supposed to boldly say so that I can have it. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart you believe and with the mouth pff, confession is made unto. It causes you to enter into that grace. Wow. Wow. God has said so anything God has said. If God says that Jesus took a blow, a bruise, a wound on his body for my physical healing, then I am healed based on what the Word of God says. If God said Jesus became poor on the cross so that I would become rich, then I'm rich. 
well, I believe I'll be rich someday. No, that's, that's like saying after you accept the Lord as Savior, say, well, I'll be righteous someday. No, you don't become righteous after you do a bunch of righteous stuff. Come on. You don't become righteous because you do a bunch of righteous stuff. You become righteous because you accepted, by grace, Jesus' righteousness. That's what made you right. You have to do the same thing in every other area. You're not rich because you did something, because you're so smart and you did all these business. You No, you're rich because Jesus made you rich. I believe that was part of the revelation that we got years ago. That We, let, we were hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. Hundreds of thousands in debt. And yet we got a revelation, and I got it first, and I started thinking, wait a minute. I don't tithe, and I don't give to try and get rich. I tithe and give because I am rich. Just like I don't not yield to sin to try and become righteous. No, I don't yield to sin because I am am already righteous. Wow. God has said, so that we may boldly say. So if God has said, like in John 14, 27, he gave me his peace, don't let your emotions rule you, then that means you can control your feelings, not your feelings control you. Because God said. So are you believing what God said? You've got to put it boldly in your mouth and declare it. This is good stuff, man. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Wow. All right, Lord. I'm done. Was this all right? Come on, let's lift up our hands and give him praise. Lord, we lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting, and we magnify you. The fruit of our lips, we give you thanks, Lord God. Hallelujah. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. Hallelujah. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, everyone that is saved, you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you're not ashamed to admit it. Hold your hand up real high. Say, I'm saved, I've accepted Jesus, and I'm proud of it. Yeah. All right, looks like, looks like we're all family. Are we online tonight? We're not online tonight. Okay, so I won't pray for the camera then. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Isn't God's Word supernatural? It prepares us. If we take it, it prepares us. Jesus did that when he told the disciples. He, he gave us, you know, when you read the story, I'll, I'll try and make this real quick, but when you read the story in Matthew 14 where <clears throat> Jesus comes walking on the water and they got all afraid, Jesus had prepared them before he ever went out to them. He had prepared them to not get in fear. He had said, you guys get in the boat and go to the ship, uh, go to the other side of the sea, and I will meet you there. So he had already prepared them. So when he went walking on the sea and they saw him and they thought it was a ghost cried out for fear, they shouldn't have done that. They should have said, wait a minute, what, what are we getting afraid of? Jesus said, go to the other side. Let's just obey him. We may not understand what's out there, but let's go to the other side. They didn't have to fear because of that. You know what's really interesting? I'd never seen this till a few years ago in my study. I was studying and I started reading that same story in Mark's gospel. Mark's gospel actually says this. It says Jesus was walking on the water now listen to this, and would have passed them by. He, was, he had no intention of stopping them and having Peter walk on the water, do any of that. His whole intention was to meet them on the other side. He was walking on the water and would have passed them by, but he saw them get in fear. Isn't that interesting? In other words, the one word I gave you was enough to put you over to the other side. One word. Brother Copeland has made that statement for years. One word of God can change your life forever. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Donnie, aren't you glad one word by his stripes you are healed, took care of cancer? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 
He's, he's, he's mending, recovering, man. When we met Donnie, he was in a wheelchair. He couldn't even walk. Now he's up walking around and getting stronger every day. And it's because of Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Come on, lift your hands up again. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, you're so good, Lord. You're so good. You're so good. You're so good. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Worship you. We worship you. We worship you. You are good, Lord. You are good. You are good. I just heard these words. I don't know if this means anybody to anybody, but I heard kneecap. Does somebody have a problem or pain or an injury to a kneecap that's in here? If, if that's you, lift your hand up real quick. Somebody have something wrong, uh, a pain that you've been having in your kneecap? Anybody? All right, stand up. All right, I won't, Lord. He said, don't lay hands on them. So just stay right where you're at. Father, right now we speak to that knee, <clears throat> that kneecap and whatever the problem is. <clears throat> we command you be whole in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father, for quickening that kneecap and every part of that knee, making it completely whole. He will lay down in peace tonight. And rise up healthy and whole. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Someone, there's someone here you're trying to make a decision about. I think it's a career change. I'm, I'm not sure if that, I think that's what it is. That's what it looks like in the spirit here. Uh, you're, you're praying, Lord, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do right now? Receive the wisdom of God. Receive impartations of the wisdom of God. He's, he's hearing your cries, hearing your prayer, and he's answering, even imparting you tonight the knowing of what you're supposed to do. So walk, yeah, walk in peace. Walk in peace. If you start moving one direction, you don't have a peace on the inside, you stop. You, you follow after peace. Let peace be your umpire. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Worthy are you, Lord. Worthy are you, Lord. Worthy are you, Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, Lord Jesus. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Uh, something to do with a wrist. I don't know if it's both wrist or one wrist here. I'm seeing a wrist. And whether, I don't know if it's carpal tunnel syndrome or what it is, but right now, the wrist, lift your hand up if that's you. In Jesus' name, Father, we speak to those wrists. I curse the very thing that causes the pain. Jesus, you told me that when you bore our sickness and disease, it included all body malfunction. So I thank you right now. These wrists will function perfectly the way you designed them in the body to be healed in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Worthy are you, Lord. Worthy are you, Lord. Worthy are you, Lord. Did you know, I heard the Lord say this, did you know that nerve damage is not a big deal for me to heal? So nerve damage, I speak to nerve damage right now. If that's you, take hold of this. I, I curse nerve damage, and I say that Jesus is not only a healer, he's a miracle worker. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be not only saved from sin, but healed and made whole as part of salvation. So I speak to nerve damage, and I say be made whole in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Lord God. You know, uh, over the verse we quote, it's Christmas time all the, all the time in Isaiah chapter 9, where we say his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor of the Mighty God, the Prince of Peace. That word wonderful, look it up. Don't take my word for it. Look up the Hebrew definition of that word wonderful. The first definition is miracle. Jesus, our miracle. Woo, that lives on the inside of us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Lord, is there anything else you want me to say, do? I won't try and conjure up anything or make anything up, Lord, but I'll sure yield to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Worthy are you, Lord. Worthy are you, Lord. Worthy are you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Liz, you got... Amen. Glory to God. I just feel like, is there anybody in this place that is not filled with the Holy Ghost? Anybody doesn't speak in other tongues? Because that's a gift from heaven. Amen. Anybody, lift up your hand. It's okay. You don't have to be afraid because God wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost. He says when he fills us with the Holy Ghost, we're endued with power from on high. And in these last days especially, we need to have that power. We all have the Holy Ghost when we get born again. But when we receive the Holy Ghost, when we have hands laid on us and we receive the empowerment of the Holy Ghost and it comes on the inside of us and the word that the Holy Ghost prays through us. He prays out mysteries. He prays out the plan of our life. You know what we would always say when we were praying one time at the ministry, we were praying, we were praying the Holy Ghost. Pray, and the Lord kept saying, we're praying out the plan for the man. So he's praying out the plan for your life. When we pray in the Holy Ghost, we're praying out God's plan. You're praying out God's plan for your life if you want to pray, if you're praying it for you. So we need to be praying in the Holy Ghost. Paul said, I pray in tongues more than you all. Why? Why? Because it's like a, it's like a charger cable that just charges you up and builds you up. The Bible in Jude, it tells us that praying in the Holy Ghost, building up yourself on your most holy faith. And what was he talking about tonight? We, we receive by faith that grace to walk in what God's called us to walk into. Everything he's provided for us. Amen? Amen? So I want to encourage you. I want to compel you. I want to I wanna just, just like, please come and get the Holy Ghost. Because God, it's a gift just like salvation. It's a gift. And it will help you and encourage you and charge you up and help you pray out the plan for your life. Pray out the plan for your children. Pray out the plan for everything that you have. Pray out the plan for what am I going to do today, Lord? And those words just come up on the inside of you. And they just come up and they just come up. And we don't even have to understand it. The Bible says we don't understand it. But the Bible says that we may not understand it in our own mind, but we're praying secrets and mysteries unto God and we're causing those things to be it goes right back to what you're talking about the words that come out of our mouth we're, 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 we're sending out those words we're prophesying our life by the power of the Holy Ghost by the Holy Ghost we don't know what tomorrow brings but guess what he does amen so anybody anybody please come on up if you'd like to be prayed by prayed for to receive the Holy Ghost. Does everybody feel with the Holy Ghost? Raise your hand if you are filled with the Holy Ghost and you pray in another tongue. Amen. 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 Well, then maybe God just wants to encourage you to do it more. Amen. I'm encouraged to do it more. I've been working on doing it more. We were just in California and we were just doing it more. More, 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 more. Hallelujah. Because we want to be charged up. We want to be made a greater blessing. We want to be able to be build ourselves on our most holy faith, walking in the love of God. It also it does. There's so many benefits of that. Amen. Amen. If you were afraid to raise your hand and you just don't know, you know what? Come up to us afterwards. We'll be glad to take you aside. We don't want to embarrass anybody. God's a perfect gentleman. The Holy Ghost, he's a perfect gentleman. He will not embarrass anybody, but he wants you to have every single thing Jesus did for you. Amen? Amen, amen. So come up to pastors, to, to Pastor Cindy, to Larry or I, uh, and, and we will be more than happy to talk to you about it and answer any questions and lay hands on you and just get you filled, yeah. and you'll be happy. <laughs> You'll be so happy. Amen. Oh, honey, when, whenever I got filled with the Holy Ghost, I was actually in my Methodist church, which believed speaking in tongues was of the devil. <laughs> I was in my Methodist church, and I got filled. And then I started reading what Paul said even more. I said, you know, when Paul said, when I pray in tongues, an unknown tongue, he said, it's unknown to me, but not to God. He said, God causes me to speak in the spirit things that my brain doesn't get a hold of. 
And so when you're speaking divine mysteries, divine secrets, you're, speak, you're praying out the perfect will of God for your life and other people's lives. So that's why it's such a benefit. So if you are filled but have not been praying in tongues, then take the encouragement of the Holy Ghost tonight and start praying in the Spirit more, man. Everywhere you go, man, every time I drive somewhere and when I'm in the shower, when I play golf, I pray in tongues. It doesn't help my golf game, but just so you know. It could, it could. <laughs> when I don't know how to swing the club, hold on, I like how Basha. Amen. So, so like she said, if you are not filled with the Holy Ghost, you don't pray in tongues, but you would like to come see pastors, us, Pastor Cindy, shoot the sound person, get you filled with the Holy Ghost here. So, so in, anybody here. So praise God. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. I know pastor is going to come and and give you an opportunity to sow into our ministry, and we thank you in advance for that. We're going to be praying over that and praying and believing with you for an abundance of financial grace to come back on the seed you sow tonight because God said so, right? God said when you sow bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully, and he said all grace will abound to you so that you have all sufficiency and all things can abound to every good work. So God wants you blessed. We don't give to get. We give because we're rich. We give because we honor God, and then we happen to just get a harvest on our sowing. It's just a win-win situation. So praise God. Pastor Larry and Pastor Charlotte, thank you for inviting us back the 23rd time. I think, I think y'all are number one for the, the, how many times I've preached at a church, except I don't know, maybe you've got them beat. I don't know. We'll have to see. But you know, all these years for almost 40 years now, of course, we weren't that 23 times that we preached here doesn't count when we came with the Rama Singers and Band. So there's a couple more times, but anyway, thank you. We love you guys. You're precious. And please, like I said this morning, if you weren't here this morning, you didn't hear me say this, follow him on Facebook because he puts things inspired by God, prophetic utterance that God gives him, and, and it'll build you. It'll help you. Promise, I promise, I promise. It does me. So I know it'll help you. Praise God. Come on, Pastor Larry. Sure love you.